What's up, kids? How's it going? I look like a totally different person when I do that, don't I? <clears throat> How's it going, dudes and dudettes? All you people in the YouTubins, YouTuberville, Turboville, boys and girls, children of all ages, <clears throat> kids. Adults, grandparents, boomers, how y'all doing? Good to see ya. So today, <clears throat> what I've got on the slab for y'all is a uh, little presentation of some of the highlights of some material by a woman by the name of Catherine Austin Fitz, who is somebody that I discovered on Lord Voldemort's show. And I found her quite by accident, but I was really intrigued by what I was seeing in this video. And so I started like screen recording it. And so I've got some notes here of the basics of what she was talking Some of it's kind of more or less verbatim. But see, the, the problem is, is the main interview, the first interview I saw, it was, was very much censored. You're not going to find it on a YouTube reveal. You're not going to find it on a lot of places. In fact, I don't think anywhere in Google you can even search it. And I think I might have had to go to DuckDuckGo to get it. Or you can just go onto the um, Planet Lockdown um, website, I think, and you can watch the whole thing. And so it, uh, it's her Planet Lockdown interview that she did in 2020 during the PDIM. And she has a very interesting perspective. She is someone who has worked in the deepest sectors of the financial industry for decades, um, all the way up to, um, you know, like the federal level. So Catherine Austin Fitz. She's currently the publisher of the Solari Report. I say Solari, she calls it the Solari Report. And it's her company, so I figured she knows how to say it, but it sounds wrong to me. I say Solari, Solari Report. She says the Solari Report, I'll call it the Solari Report. I'll put some respect on that name because I think she knows what she's doing. She's a little smarter than me. Now I've done a couple of presentations on her already and we'll move on to the meat and potatoes of what we're trying to get done today in the realm of exploring the essence of uh, what it is that she has, has said. Um, and it's, it's stuff that, it's, it's quite an indictment to the, the establishment. And she's one of the first people that once I listened to what she was saying, I think I had to listen several times. I started getting a little bit scared. And I, I looked her up online and like, if you look her up on Google, they, they say she's a conspiracy theorist. So I guess that means that she's doing something right. She's challenging the sort of official 
sort of normie boomer narrative. She might be a boomer herself, but she is, she's a based boomer. She's boomer based. And, um, no, I have a lot of respect for her actually. She's, she's got, she's taught me a lot of stuff. And so I'm going to impart some of that information onto y'all and we can learn together. Like I said, I've done a couple of videos talking about her and so far, and I'm probably going to repeat some of this because I've got this sort of scripted out as if you've seen my other videos, when it comes to technical details, I like to sort of at least have my thing scripted out. And pretty soon I'm going to don my boomer glasses. Shout out to Jay Dyer. And once I get my boomer glasses on, you know that I'm reading off a, off a teleprompter here. And I'm going to try and make it sound convincing for you so it you don't fall asleep. Because uh, if I just read it, you know, things could get pretty ugly. I don't do this a lot. I don't make videos very often. And so I lack practice. So my elocution can sometimes be a bit compromised. And uh, we'll work on that. It might take a few years because, like I said, I don't do this very often. So without further ado, we'll move into the... Uh, the main text of our program. Hi, boys and girls. I'm back. And uh, so we'll get into, oh man, my thing turned sideways. So I'm gonna get my boomer glasses on <clears throat> and we'll get started. Okay, so Catherine Austin Fitz publisher of the Soleri Report and managing director of Soleri Investment Advisory Services. Okay, so I've gone through some of Catherine Fitz's ideas in previous episodes. Up until now, those have focused mainly on her journal, the Soleri Report. Now in this episode, I will touch on some of the material from various interviews she's done. And that's where this is going to get a little bit hairy. I mean, one main interview, the one which caught my attention and brought her into my purview to begin with, is the Planet Lockdown interview that she did, which was broadcast on Lord Voldemort's website and then subsequently removed from nearly every platform it was posted on. So I have to be careful on Hugh Turbeville relaying any of the ideas she presented. Obviously she said a few things that the establishment doesn't want people to think about. So I'll kind of mix things up a little bit. Now in the Planet Lockdown interview, she began with talking about how the dollar was losing its grip as the world reserve currency, being an outdated transaction system, lacking the control apparatus that the Federal Reserve wants implemented. Besides, with BRICS and other competing currencies kind of jockeying for global economic supremacy, we find ourselves in a transitional phase, trying to speed up the new system while dragging out the old. Meanwhile, keeping the general population from knowing quite what it is. Now, keep in mind, this interview was given in 2020, maybe six months into the PDIM. So the dollar system is old and unsustainable and it needs to evolve and change. The central bankers have devised a new system and would like to bring it in. Much of it at the time of this interview was being tested, tried, and prototyped 
and by now is most certainly ready. And it involves many industries. She describes it as the end of currencies. Because it's not so much a currency, but a digital, probably blockchain, transaction system, which will end all currencies as we know them. And it involves all the money in the world. And so the question for the central bankers is, how do we market a system that if people understood it, nobody would want? Well, one way to get it started is with some kind of crisis. She said a healthcare crisis, but it doesn't have to do with healthcare. It could involve C-L-I-M-A-T-E developments or news. The air conditioner just kicked on. I try to have that turned off before I get started here. Hold your horses. <sighs> okay. And another question. How do you herd all the sheep into the slaughterhouse without them realizing and resisting? Well, the solution is invisible enemies. Now, what are some examples of invisible enemies? Hmm. Let's use our memories and go back a few years. We could go back to 2001 or just back to 2020. There are many invisible enemies which could be conjured up in order to implement control systems with or without the consent of the people. So the war on T-E-R-R-O-R, -R -R, we had invisible terrorists with the mustard gashes. Good old George W. Thanks, J. Dyer. If he ever sees this, he's going to know I'm using his lexicon. J. Dyer has a specific algorithm code that he uses when he, <laughs> when he does his podcast, which may or may not be preventing the algorithm from picking him up and demoting him to less visibility. He gets pretty good visibility, so I guess it's working. And how would I ever know whether it's working with me or not? Because I get no visibility. But Center my head a little bit more into this video. <clears throat> now, oh, wait. Okay. And so now we have the invisible V word. What, what's the invisible V word? Uh... Verucasis, uh, vi Vicadrises, Vicadrises. <laughs> I guess we're going to call them Vicadrises. And so now we have an invisible Vicadris, the Koof, which can come back at any time under myriad different disguises and variants. The best thing about invisible enemies is you can't prove they don't exist or if the science is beyond your scope to disprove it. Now, invisible enemies are always preferred, especially if they scare people. If you can induce fear, you can convince the public that they need the government to protect them. Then you have the second tactic, divide and conquer. And the media plays a very important role here. If you can turn people against one another, whether they be men versus women, Democrat versus Republican, black versus white, Skittles versus not. One of the reasons to flood the country with illegal immigrants is to turn the general population against them as well. In addition to increasing your voter base with a desperate hopefully less educated contingent who should be grateful for the handout they've just received. So then you need the government to be in the middle to mediate and control the dialectics through narrative control. 
So, whether it's divide and conquer or invisible enemies, these are always utilized to institute fear and to get the people to go along with a narrative or agenda. The invisible coof enables them to enact enormous control mechanisms like stopping people from gathering, communicating, and organizing. And if you can implement contact T-R-A-C-I-N-G, you can know who's talking to whom. If you can get people to Skype into work or Zoom into school, you can listen to and record everything they say. So they can institute all kinds of surveillance under the auspices of protecting you from the invisible enemies. And this works with many, many people. And let's not underestimate the ability of our leadership to induce pathogens that can kill. We're not going to suggest anybody hasn't kicked the bucket or hasn't gotten a little under the weather. These things have been planned, orchestrated, produced, and distributed. They're trying to get people to buy into a solution before you can see where it's ultimately going to go. It's like Nancy Pelosi saying that you have to pass the bill in order to find out what's in it. Because now we're talking about implementing a transaction system which is no longer a currency. The CBDC has the capacity to act as a control system. It's like a credit at the company store. If a central bank comes out with a blockchain currency through the use of programmable smart contracts, they have the ability to turn your money on or off, as well as adjust it for various other parameters. So if you don't behave, that's it. You're done. Or at least suspended or limited. They can contour your account to a fine-tuned outcome of what they want you to be capable of doing limits on savings ability, special prices or taxes, depending on your social or political status, race, any sort of demography. Limits can be imposed on where you spend your money, what you spend it on, how long you have to spend it, whether you get to spend it at all. Your balance can be wiped at the end of the week or at the end of the day. You might not get to use it beyond five miles of your home, whatever that is, your coon pod. And they want to combine all of this with transhumanism, which means I take stabbies that can institute the equivalent of an operating system within my body. So now I'm hooked into the financial system physically. So now the interview here asks her, what is the effect on the L-O-C-K down measures? She says that she used to call it the Patriot Act, the Concentration and Control of Cash Flow Act. And this is a similar process. They're trying to centralize economic and political control. As an example, a hundred small businesses on Main Street declare them all non-essential shut them down. Amazon, Walmart, Target, etc. come in and take away the market share. Meanwhile, these Main Street businesses have to keep paying their bills and their debt. They're trapped, desperate for cash flow, for everyday expenses. The Federal Reserve Institute's quantitative easing. Money printer goes burr in this case, buying corporate bonds. And at the time of this interview, the box stores are financing at zero to one percent. Obviously, since 2020, the Fed has raised interest rates multiple times. But for a time, those in the know were able to exploit this, while all the small independent businesses are paying much higher interest rates on their credit cards without any income. Now, in the 2016 election cycle, the general population supported more populist candidates, like old Bernie 
and old Donnie T. Of course, uh, Hill Dog had the primary kind of taken care of, got rid of Bernie, paid him off for his troubles, tried to have the general election taken care of, and lost anyway. Wow, big bummer for everyone who supported the neocon establishment war machine. She was talking about going to war with Russia even back then, if you remember her debate with uh, Donnie T. So, Bernie was a populist relative to the other Democrat candidates. Donnie T was a populist relative to the other Republican candidates. So, what the globalist capital class realized was that this was a problem, which could only be solved by destroying the independent income of small businesses and independent practitioners and people who had independent sources of income. If you were independent, you were more likely to support the populist candidates. So, the way to shut the populace down is to shut off their income and support. Just put Main Street out of business, and then there's no one to finance a, a Bernie or what have you. And so here the interviewer asks her whether the lockdown is more of an economic thing than a bikeadress thing. And she answers that we are in an economic in addition to other kinds of war. After April 2020, we saw global billionaires increase their net worth by 6 to 7x. The Muskernuts, Jeff Bezos, Gil Bates. And what do you think they're doing now with all that money? I mean, don't we find it odd what all these large corporations are doing now? openly flouting the desires and goodwill of their customers, just spitting in the faces of the people. They don't care. This is no longer about profits. This is about hanging with the corporate big dogs. BlackRock now makes the rules. And all of the corporations of which they own controlling shares now do their bidding. And that's how this works. Diversity, equity, and inclusion. Environmental, social, and governance. Environmental sustainability goals. The whole Bud Light thing. And Disney. They can lose $7 billion and they don't care. They are in the it crowd. And they no longer need you. Go ahead. Boycott them all you want. At the end of the day, they're still going to be on top. And that's guaranteed. The COOF guaranteed that. You see, once you have a majority of the money, you don't need money anymore. The only thing left to gain after that is power, influence, and control. Control of people and a seat at the round table with the big dogs. How much bigger did BlackRock get after the PDEM? Who knows? They own controlling shares of almost every major corporation in the world. Starbucks, Apple, Pfizer, Moderna, NBC, CNN, and even Fox, for all of you who think there's a difference. Plus many, many more. And they're coming for all the land, which means controlling agriculture as well. These are the kinds of monopolies that Teddy Roosevelt was trying to break up back in the first decade of the 20th century. So what happened to that? And who's going to do that now? No one, because that's what the establishment wants. All this just goes to show that this has been a very successful economic war. You have the global capitalist class, which shouldn't even be called capitalist because it's not. It's actually economic totalitarianism or some kind of techno-fascism. They've been able to consolidate vast amounts of economic wealth, not just by taking the income of the middle class and bringing it into their companies, but by significantly multiplying the wealth and power of the largest G7 developed countries and China in relation to the emerging markets. 
the countries with the most advanced technology and the access to AI and software, digital systems, and even space are consolidating economic power in relation to the weaker nations. So we're seeing a consolidation of economic power, centralization, both into the wealthier and more powerful nations and the top 1% controlling them. She says that what the coup is, in a practical sense, is the institution of controls necessary to convert the planet from democratic process to technocracy or technopoly. So we're watching a change in control and an engineering of new control systems. It's more like a coup d'etat than a vicodress, if you know what I mean. So we've had a financial coup d'etat happening over the last 20 some odd years. At the end of 1995, a decision was made to move much of the assets and money out of the country. That was part of bubbling the economy with globalization. And they knew that once they finished moving all those assets, they would have to consolidate and change the fundamental system. So after the financial coup, you've stolen all the money from the pension funds and from the government. And rather than telling people you stole the money, you need an excuse that will allow you to consolidate and change the fundamental system, ergo the magic vicodress. And thanks to the magic vicodress, we have to fundamentally change the system. There's no money in Social Security or in the Treasury. And so here you have your perfect magic excuse. Every implication of the financial coup has been solved by the magic vicodress. She says, if you're a financial person and you look at the world through the mathematics of time and money, it's quite amazing that anybody believes it, but they do. They're part of what C.J. Hopkins calls the Cufidian cult, more or less. So you join the cult and say, yeah, the magic vicodress took all the money from Social Security. The magic vicodress caused all our pension funds to be insufficient. So then the interviewer asks, what do you think the technocracy we're being pushed towards will look like? And she says, the technocracy that they're pushing towards is transhumanism. Essentially what you do is use stabbies to place materials into the body, which create the equivalent of an operating system. So everyone knows about the idea of Microsoft causing you to download an operating system into your computer, which gives Microsoft and a variety of other players a back door into your computer. And every few months you've got to update it because there are vicodresses. Now we're back to the magic vicodress, which can solve all problems. Okay, so the interview goes on a while longer after that, but I am going to actually switch gears here and go to a different interview. Maybe I'll go back to that one a little bit later. I didn't want to play out the whole thing. There, there's a lot of really good stuff there later when she starts talking about the... Uh, uh, the land grabs that were going on during the riots, but um, we'll get back to that in another episode. Okay, so now I'm going to switch gears here and go into a different interview, which Catherine, uh, <laughs> some turkeys running around outside. Um, <clears throat> where was I? Okay, so now I'm going to switch gears here and go into a different interview, which Catherine Austin Fitz did with a group called, I think, Narrativa, a Dutch media group. And so the interview starts starts off with his first question for Catherine. He says, uh, he, he says, we'll discuss insights into the mechanics of our society, especially through investment and money stories, which can be quite powerful, as we all know. Everybody talks about power, but is is it really just power? He's asking about money. Is money just power? And she says, well, money is a tool. And the financial system is a tool kit. That's part of the governance system. And that's where the power is, is in the governance system. But the financial system is used for a variety of purposes, including incentivizing and controlling people. So it's a management tool, and you use it to optimize and manage resources and to incentivize. She said when she worked on Wall Street, it wasn't about how do you get to Rome. It was how do you engineer the money so that everybody can make money going to Rome. 
and that's how it's accomplished. So it's an incentive system. You know, it's kind of like uh, that interview that Lex Friedman did with um, what's the guy's name, the founder of Ethereum. Can't remember his name for some. Oh, Vitalik Buterin, Vitalik Buterin. Um, he was saying that like with money, you know, you if you give somebody money, they're more likely to do what you want, right? So, because he talked about the same thing. There, Lex Friedman asked him what money was, and he started kind of explaining it. And it, and it kind of rhymes with what she's saying here. It's an incentive system. And so uh, the interviewer says, I thought of it as a shared fiction because at the end it's nothing. <clears throat> and if we agree that this table is the God of our religion, then it is. <clears throat> but there's one difference because even if I don't believe that this money has any worth, but I know that the other guy believes it has worth, I can use it. She answered how John Maynard Keynes explained the stock market as like a beauty contest, except instead of judging who you think is the most beautiful, you're trying to figure out who the other judges will think is the most beautiful. And so he said, uh, you got known during this Karunka crisis, but have you been known before? She said that she had, when she was working on Wall Street, she'd been known in that world as someone who had certain abilities. Then when she worked in Washington, she started a successful company. So she was known in the financial world. Then she had a well-known and brutal fight with the Department of Justice and the U.S. government over the mortgage corruption which was taking place, and that caused her to be known in other spheres. Then she had a struggle with one of the major U.S. newspapers while she was in the Bush administration and found out they were a criminal enterprise. And when she had her company in Washington and was cleaning up the mortgage fraud, she discovered that the biggest Washington paper was also a criminal enterprise. And she then decided she was going to stop speaking out to the media and just talk directly to people and answer their questions. And so she started doing radio interviews and answering questions. And this evolved into two businesses, the Solari Report, which she would have bet a million dollars she would have never done in a million years to publish anything ever again. And it came from answering questions. So in answer, there were many networks of people who knew who she was but somehow the Planet Lockdown interview resonated with a lot of people and it went viral and she reached a much larger audience. And that's how I discovered her on Lord Voldemort's channel. She didn't know why. It was a lot of stuff she'd said many times before in other discussions. There was one new piece, the injectogenection fraud, and it reflected years of working as an investment advisor helping families who were struggling with health care and fraud malpractice and particularly the vac vaccine waters vapor rub injury and she wrote it not from the standpoint of health but from the standpoint of family wealth and what vac vaccine waters vapor rub injury does to destroy family wealth and it made sense once people saw the money and the science together and so the interview says, uh, the Karunka Dunka crisis is not only a medical science crisis. It's not just Big Pharma who is profiting from the people, but it's also a financial crisis or a financial action at least. And she said, I would describe it as a change in the governance system. It's a change in control and it's a change in how the governance system is managed towards much tighter central control. As a part of that, it is a consolidation of a part of the financial coup that started two decades ago. And you're watching a profound re-engineering of the financial system as part of that change of control. Because in fact, the financial transaction system will be one of the primary tools to control people at a very intimate, frightening level. And so he says, I think if we spend the discussion just understanding this sentence and she cuts him off and she says yes it will be a gruesome conversation and so he says uh, well let's just repeat this slowly we have a financial coup which has been going on for 20 years or so and she said it's been going on for a long time but it really kicked off strongly in October 1997 and has been going on ever since 
And so he asked her, how did you know this? Can you just give us like three to five minutes to understand why you have that insight? And she says, and so she gives a bit of her life story here. She says, as a young child, I came to the conclusion that the only source of reliable intelligence on what the adults were up to was mapping out the money. In other words, I grew up as a child going back and forth between many different cultures, and even though everybody spoke English, they all spoke different languages. And there were very different protocols on who would be honest about what. And I finally realized if I could just map out the financial transactions that were going on and the financial ecosystem of a situation, that's how I could figure everything out. Because the adults were lying to themselves and they were lying to each other. Sort of a multiple personality disorder world. And so I started to map money. And my theory was I was going to map out the money in a neighborhood and figure out why a neighborhood couldn't be wonderful if you could just get the money working with the people right. And what I didn't understand as a child was to understand all the money in one little neighborhood. You have to understand all the money on the planet. You have to understand global markets to understand what was going on in the neighborhood. So professionally, I kept moving into jobs that would help me understand how the money works. So I started a firm when I left the Bush administration and I had discovered relational database technology. What I realized is I could pull all the money on the planet into databases and then I could look at it contiguous to environmental ecosystems. So I can map out the financial ecosystems contiguous to the living ecosystems. And when I did that, it was completely revolutionary. It helped me understand in very important and profound ways how the financial system really worked and how it related to people and living things and the environment. So it was that backdrop. <laughs> and then he says, can you be a bit more specific? I can't really grasp it right now. What would an ecosystem look like? And she says, so I came into the 90s with this remarkable understanding of how money worked both globally and place by place. Because think of the planet as a body and every community as a molecule. And the health of the body relates to the health of the molecules and vice versa. So I come into the 90s with this understanding. And part of this was understanding deeply how the U.S. federal budget works. Because most of the money in the U.S., whether private or public, is channeled and controlled through the federal budget and regulation. And I was part of a group of people in the Bush administration who got laws changed to require audited financial statements by the government. So every year you pay your taxes and you say, where's my money going? And the idea was, according to constitutional law, you're supposed to get something back that says, here's what we did with your money. So it's a fundamental principle, no taxation without representation. A process began in fiscal 1998, which starts in October 1997, whereby they started to report that they weren't going to give audited financial statements and that vast amounts of money were disappearing. It would be down in the footnotes, but it was there. And in the spring of 1997, I was doing a presentation to one of the leaders of one of the largest pension funds in the U.S., and I showed him a simulation of how we could re-engineer the federal budget in the Philadelphia area where I had grown up and dramatically improve wealth and lower the government deficits. And he looked at me and said, you don't understand, it's too late. And I said, what do you mean it's too late? And he said, they're giving up on the country. They're moving all the money out starting in the fall. Now, when he said that, I thought he meant they're shifting allocations in the portfolios as in moving all the money they could move illegally. I was wrong. What happened was vast amounts of money started to disappear from the U.S. government. And so as the debt rose, money disappeared, and that's what I call the financial coup. It started then, and as of 2015, there were over $21 trillion of undocumentable adjustments in the U.S. government. Okay, and so I missed a bit of the interview here, and then the interviewer says, this sounds so unbelievable that I think we have to make a slow motion here for people who are hearing this for the first time. So you said that even though Wall Street money is closely linked to the federal mechanics, is that right? 
mechanics? I don't know. This already is quite new to me because we have this image of it's all about deregulation and Bush Sr. and Reagan deregulated so much and financial industry does what they want. And she says, during this financial coup, what happened, and it started in the 80s, was the government operations were increasingly executed by private corporations and banks. So that literally, when I became Assistant Secretary of Housing, I would try and get the fundamental data that I needed about our operations to make sure we were obeying the law. And the defense contractor who ran the payment systems would refuse to give it to me. It was a war that went all the way to the White House, and I had to get White House support to get the data I needed to even understand. It's a private corporation, and it controls and operates the payment and information systems. And so the interviewer says, but this private corporation gets public money and they don't even get to do the audit? And she says, it is a private corporation with huge contracts. So for example, Amazon never made a profit until they got huge cloud contracts from the CIA and the US intelligence agencies. That's when they started to make a profit. Okay, so there's some missing information in here. Um, and she says, in fact, what most people see is 24 different agencies. What I see is a small number of banks and defense contractors who are controlling and running all the blank and controlling the bank accounts. And literally what you're watching is a government that no longer has information sovereignty or financial sovereignty. There's no sovereignty there. Thanks to a series of laws and administrative dictums, they now reserve the right to keep all of their finances secret. Okay, I think she's talking about FASB, what is it? FASB 56? I can't remember what it's called. So the interviewer says, okay, so you see I'm a bit surprised. Can you describe the clash of narratives going on in my head? What is the other one you are describing to me? So she says, I know exactly what the problem is. When I first went to Washington, I did not own a television, but I have a friend who said you can't work for the Bush administration without owning a TV. So I'm a money person and I'm trained to have a mastery of how the money works. I was deeply involved in both the federal budget and something something in the mortgage market. So I'm watching all the federal budget and I'm watching all the mortgage credit and the treasury credit. So I'm watching the money. One thing you understand if you watch money is our world is built by transactions. So we have visions, but we implement transactions of both time and money, okay? So I'm watching all the transactions, and the transactions don't lie. If all the money's going to Rome, you can see all the money's going to Rome. But then everybody gets on the talk shows, and they go yakety yakety yak, and that's why we're doing this, and that's why we're doing that. That world has nothing to do with this world. This world's going to Rome, and that world's saying we're going to Paris. And what you realize is there's an official reality, and then there's reality train tracks. She said, I've never been to Disney World, but I've had many friends who have gone, and I've seen all the videos. Underground, you've got the administrative apparatus, engineering everything you're seeing upstairs. All the scheduling and all the work. And then there's this beautiful world upstairs with Minnie and Mickey and everybody's happy, right? And our world is a little bit like that. You have the plumbing underground and everybody's engineering the transactions. And so if you're a money person, you live in both worlds together. And he says, okay, and this is why you have been talking about personality disorders, because you have to cope with having several stories that are contradictory in your mind. And she says, well, if you travel a lot, it's a little bit like going back and forth between many cultures. And different cultures have different values, and they have different narratives and different stories. And unfortunately, if you're an average American between World War II and now, as the national security state got bigger and bigger, you have a military and global governance system that's running the world, and their primary business is war and organized crime. But if you want to believe you're a good Christian... The way you resolve that is everybody gets a little bit of extra money as a result of the war machine, but you also get the story of, I am good. 
and it works because then you can only do your job from Monday to Friday and then you go to church you're washed in the blood and you feel good about yourself and then you go back out and so he says how does the story I am good sound like I mean how is it told and she says we're going to war to save democracy we're the good guys Does sound familiar <laughs> So let's get back to the money disappearing. So she gives the names of her websites. I have two websites, solari.com and something about missing money, something or other. I have documented this. Okay, and this is her talking. I've documented this up the Wazubi, totally documented, and you can find all of it. What happened the first time I discovered is when 59 billion went missing from HUD, the Department of Housing and Urban Development, so we were reading some of the congressional testimony and it came out that 59 billion had gone missing which is the reason yet again that they couldn't produce their audited financial statements and they weren't going to bother to figure it out and the mortgage fraud was off the charts so we started to dig in and what we were discovering was huge amounts of money were disappearing from HUD and the Department of Defense at the same time, the private equity firms in Washington, who had little experience, were suddenly blessed with capital. And then suddenly, business with all these companies associated with the same people. At least that's what I think she said. Again, there's some missing info. The same boards as the contractors who are running the financial systems at these agencies. So we're watching the same people. Their companies are suddenly getting these huge amounts of mysterious money. So we started to look at that, and I got a reporter involved. She started to write these fabulous stories about the missing money, and she had this whole series going. We were finally going to rope that into a huge cover story. Her weekly magazine that would go out to all these congressmen and senators. And we were just coming into the big headline. It was going to be the following Friday. Okay, I'm going to end it here. I know it's a bit of a cliffhanger, but I don't want this to go on too long. I just wanted to give you a little bit of the gist of what Catherine Austin Fitz is all about. I think she's somebody worth listening to. I'm not sure how much longer she's going to be around, and I think she's a national treasure. Someone who isn't afraid to tell the truth about what's going on. She knows what's going on in the financial world. I don't agree with everything she says. I don't agree with some of the things she says about crypto. At least I hope she's wrong about crypto. She seems to think it's the prototype for what the NWO is going to do to us through the CBDC and blockchain. I hope she's wrong. I'm still hoping to create wealth through crypto, so I'm buying it as sort of a Hail Mary before the government kidnaps me and sticks me in a coon pod. It's the last hope for the sovereignty of humanity as far as I can see. I mean, I hope I'm wrong about all this. I'd like to see a pot of gold at the end of the rainbow. But if things don't go the way I'm foreseeing, I'll be pleasantly surprised and would totally welcome the idea of being wrong about all the doom and gloom I'm beginning to see on the horizon as a result of some of the books I've been reading. Because the more you learn about actual history and not all that garbage you learned in school, the scarier this world gets. As it is, I can't even play music. I can't join a band right now. I can barely even pick up a guitar. I can't even listen to music. I have to listen to as much content as I can and read as many books as I can to hope to try and get a hold of what's left of my future and my kids' future. When I was a kid, the future seemed really cool. Now the future seems really bleak. All of those cool technological advancements we couldn't wait to come down the pike they're not for our pleasure. The more I learn about technology, the more I realize that these are tools for our enslavement. So anyway, I'll leave it there. <laughs>